decided to follow Jesus? Yeah. That right there. It should start blinking. Is there a red blinking light? Did you push it in? <laughs> All right. I got to train you guys when I'm not going to be here. So when Brother Bruce comes in, I don't know what to do with that stuff. Um, all right. So 316, I have decided to follow Jesus. And we'll do all three verses. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Amen. Find your Bibles. Turn to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, we'll read the whole chapter. Got my wires in here. All right, Exodus chapter 21, starting there, verse 1. The Bible reads, Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, he shall also bring him to the door or unto the door post, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men's servants do. If she please not her master who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed to sell her unto a strange nation. He shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. And if he do not these three unto her, then shall, shall she go out free without money. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. And if a man strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed, 
If he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the, lo for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. And if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall, he shall be surely punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And if a man smite the eye of his servant, or the eye of his maid, that it perished, he shall let him go f free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth, and, or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then, then the ox shall be surely stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall shall be quit. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, and it hath been, been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. Whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment shall it be done unto him. If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto, unto their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. And if a man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit, and not cover it, and an ox or an ass fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good, and give money unto the owner of, the, of them, and the dead beast shall be his. And if one man's ox hurt another, another's that he die, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it, and the dead ox also they shall divide. Or if it be known that the ox hath used to push in time past, and, and his owner hath not kept him in, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead ox, and the dead shall be his own. Let's open with a word of prayer to Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for this afternoon, and pray that you'd help me to preach this message rightly. I pray that you fill me with your spirit. I pray that you meet with us, and I pray that everything that we do would be glorifying to you. We thank you for your word, and Lord, we pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, I want to preach about a subject here that is, is definitely a very controversial subject when it comes to Christianity and what the world thinks of Christianity and the Bible, is dealing with um, slavery. Okay, Now, what, I'm, what the name of this sermon is, is actually indentured servants versus slaves. Okay? So when people come at the Bible, and this is the chapter they're going to come after. Okay, there's a lot of things in this chapter they're going to come after. Um, but they're going to come after this idea of, of you know, selling somebody or having a bond servant or you know, this, this whole thing that this is talking about here in Exodus chapter 21. But you know, it, it's funny because I listen to these people try to defend the Bible. You know, um, this is the one thing where John MacArthur was talking to Ben Shapiro, and they, they were talking about slavery, and they both are trying to defend this, right? Because Ben Shapiro is a Jew, and, you know, this is Exodus, right? So he claims to believe the Torah, right, or the law. And so they're trying to, to figure out how, to, how do we defend this and say, hey, this is, you know, this is God's word. And John MacArthur is the same way, trying to defend this. And both of them are wrong in the way that they answered this, because they're basically saying, well, you know, slavery in the Bible is... You know, that was for that time back then. That's the way Ben Shapiro says it. Anytime you have to do that, that's probably a bad thing to do. Okay, unless you're dealing with customary laws, like, you know, what kind of clothing you're wearing, or, you know, like where they wore, like, the blue, uh, they had blue, like, um, uh, borders on their garments, and they had, like, they had, like, certain uh, dietary laws and stuff like that. Unless you're talking about that, this is moral law, obviously, dealing with having bond servants and all this other stuff. So, but I learned this back when I was in probably middle school, I don't know, in, in a history class, on the difference between an indentured servant and a slave. There is a difference, okay? Now, off the cuff, before we get into this, this, this sermon, listen, if the Bible says it and commands it, I believe it. 
Okay, whether the world likes that or not, I don't really care. Okay, so that's the first thing that you need to go into. When you're reading the Bible, you should not be thinking, how do I fix this? How do I explain this away? No, you should just be saying, hey, this is what God said. Okay, now let's figure out, you know, how that fits with everything else. Okay, obviously there's no contradiction in the Bible, but just because it goes against some world view, okay, doesn't mean that it's wrong. Okay, God's right, the world's wrong. Okay, and so... The, the, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof the ways of death. And sometimes as Christians, we need to be applying that a lot to ourselves when we're reading the Bible and say, listen, this doesn't seem like it's that right, but you, you got to understand that the, the Word of God is perfect. Now, um, but I want to read Wikipedia's definition of indentured servants and slavery. Because anytime I've ever heard anybody talk about this passage, they never bring this up. They're always just trying to defend slavery, you know, like trying to say, well, slavery, this is a little different, and all this other stuff. Listen, the word slave, we're going to see, is only mentioned twice in the Bible. Twice. And it's never condoning it, okay? It's never even saying, like, if you have this or that. It's just basically saying the word to refer to someone that's a slave, right? The word servants used a lot, though. And so what we're going to deal with is that we're not dealing with slavery here. We're dealing with indentured servitude, okay, which there is a difference. So according to Wikipedia, so this is the world saying this, an indentured servant or indentured laborer is an employee, indentury, I guess you, is what they have in parentheses here, within a system of unfree labor who is bound by a signed or forced contract uh, to work for a particular employer for a fixed time. The contract often lets the employer sell the labor of the indenture, indenturee to a third party. Indenturees usually enter into an indenture, into indenture for a specific payment or other benefit, or to meet a legal obligation such as debt bondage. And on uh, completion of the contract, indentured servants were given their freedom and occasionally plots of land. In many countries, systems of indentured labor have now been outlawed and are banned by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a form of slavery. Okay. So, obviously, the world is looking at this like, this is slavery, okay? But do you see, okay, now, now what it says about slavery, it says slavery is any system in which principles of property law are applied to people, allowing individuals to own, buy, sell other individuals as a, a, a de jure form of property. A slave is uh, an, an able to, or unable to withdraw unilaterally from such an arrangement and works without uh, re remuneration. Now, what this, now, the way they say this is that they would classify this probably as slavery, because they're basically just saying if, if anybody's considered property of someone else, right, then they would say that's slavery. So that even here, you know, at the end of indentured servitude, they're saying, well, this, they, they, they look at this as a form of slavery. Okay. So the way I look at it, you know, the way I was always even taught this in school was indentured servants were those that were, were servants that were paying off a debt or they were bound to serve for some purpose, right? They were paying off something. They were trying to buy something, right? And slaves were people that were forced into bondage that had nothing to do with debt or payment or anything. It was just they, they, they took them. What's interesting about this, okay, because that's the way I've always looked at slavery. Slavery is like if I just went over and just made somebody my servant, and just stole them away, and this is what our, you know, America did, and the Brit, Britain did, you know, throughout the world, and people are still doing it today, where they steal people, and they force them to work for them, and they're just basically bound to them forever, uh, with no contract, it's just basically, they just stole them away. What's interesting about this is this chapter condemns that. The one chapter that they're going to, to say, hey, the Bible is promoting slavery. What does it say in verse 16? It says, he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. You want to know what the Bible says about slavery, like in America where we stole like, people from Africa, and we stole them away and had them as property? It says that if you steal them, you're to be put to death. If you sell them, you're to be put to death. And if you're found with them, you're to be put to death. So this idea of slavery, like what, you know, what people would, you and you think of slavery, right? You would steal somebody. Listen, this happens today. There is sex trafficking going on in America today where they steal children. They steal, they steal girls and women and all this stuff. 
and they are slaves, and they're in bondage because they stole them away. All those people that do that should be put to death speedily. And the Bible is saying that right here. And so it's funny because the one chapter they go to to say, oh, you know, the Bible supports slavery is saying that you should be put to death if you do that. <laughs> the death penalty is put on that. So obviously what is being talked about in Exodus 21 can't be the same thing. You know, when we're talking about a Hebrew servant, mean a Hebrew servant and all this stuff. So we're going to talk about that. But I do want to show you the two places where the, the, the actual word slave is used. Now, if you have a new version, it's going to say slave all over the place. Because they'll say, like, the Greek word thulos means slave or servant, which is not true, by the way. But they'll say that, and so they'll be like, you're a slave for Christ, and we're slaves for Christ, and all this other stuff. And they'll say, oh, you know, see, this is what slavery is in the Bible. It's like what we are to Christ. Okay? But the Bible never uses that. I'm going to show you the two places that it's even mentioned in your King James Bible. And uh, Jeremiah 2. Go to Jeremiah 2, and it's also going to be in Revelation 18. Jeremiah 2. For the sake of time, I'm not going to look at the whole passage here, but it's just basically asking a question. And it's using this term, so it's not really condoning or condemning it here. Okay, it's just asking a question. Okay, are you a slave? You know, that, that, that's pretty much what it's asking here. In Jeremiah 2, verse 14, it says, Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? In verse 14 there. So that's the only mention in the Old Testament. And you can look at the whole context of that, obviously. So it's not, it's not condoning slavery or anything. It's just kind of asking them a question. You know, who are, who are you, Israel? Notes in Revelation 18. Revelation 18. We'll start in verse 11 just to get some context here of what we're dealing with. Revelation 18 and verse 11. It says, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and thigh and wood and all manner, and ma manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Now, this is not definitely condoning any of this. It's basically just saying, hey, this is merchandise, okay, and the slaves and souls of men. Listen, that happens today. That happens today where people are being st stolen away and people are being trafficked. Trafficked, I can't even say it. Uh, but, you know, sex trafficking and, like, all these different things that are going on. Listen, it happens in America. The NFL is being, uh, you know, like, all the stuff that's going on with them. And, and, and listen, this happens in Hollywood. This happens all across the world, but in, in America this happens, where they're stealing uh, children, they're stealing women and all this stuff to do all these, these type of services for people, and they're selling them for that. Again, the Bible says they should be put to death that do such things. But what we're dealing with here in this chapter is not that. Okay? We're not dealing with stealing people away from people and just forcing them into bondage. Does that make sense? I mean, it would, it would completely go with, against the verse that's in the middle of the chapter saying that they should be put to death. But go to Proverbs 22 and verse 7. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. You say, well, you know, uh, this doesn't make sense to me, you know, this, uh, being an indentured servant. You know what doesn't make sense is that someone could just rack up a whole bunch of debt and then just leave it and let someone else pay for it. You know what doesn't make a bunch of sense is putting people in jail for it and ruining their life, and they never get to see anybody, and they're, they're stuck in a cage. That seems a little more inhumane than them working it off, <laughs> okay? And so, you, you want a simple example of this? Go to a restaurant, eat, and then don't pay for it. You got to go back into the back and do the dishes. That's indentured servitude, okay? And you wouldn't say, well, I'm, I'm a slave. No, you earned that, <laughs> okay? You earned having to go back there and do the dishes because you didn't pay for your meal, okay? And that's what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with debt most of the time with this. Now, sometimes it is just the fact that they need a job. And so they go into a contract with somebody to be an indentured servant, to be their bond servant. Okay? You got to understand back, back then, it's not like, and especially if, you're, if you think of like maid servants and stuff like that. Listen, if, if the ladies didn't have like a husband to take care of them, you know, sometimes they'd have to go into bond, being a bond maid. And, and 
you know, in a lot of cases, they loved it because they were taken care of and, you know, all this other stuff. Now, again, you know, what we're dealing with here, Proverbs 22 and verse 7, Proverbs 22 and verse 7, notice what it says here. It says, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. The borrower is servant to the lender. Okay, so when we're dealing about being a bond servant, that's what we're dealing with here. And listen, I'm going to get some application here. You say, we say, well, we're, we're free in America. Stop paying your taxes. Let me know how that goes. The borrower servant to the lender. You want to talk to me about freedom? <laughs> Don't worry, I got, a, I got some verses for you on that one. Now, Exodus chapter 12, I do want to show you something because there is a difference between being a bond servant and being a hired servant. Okay, so as we're talking about this, I already threw slavery. Okay, we dealt with slavery, right? When we're dealing with slavery, the Bible says you put to death if you steal somebody and make them your servant. Okay, that is completely, uh, you know, against what the Bible teaches. What we're dealing with is, is being a bond servant, paying off a debt or paying, paying for something that you want, like a benefit, right? That's what it even says on Wikipedia, right? You say, well, when does that ever happen? Oh, I don't know, Jacob, when he, when he worked seven years for his wife and then worked another seven years for his other wife, that's exactly what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a contract that's being made to where you have to work a certain amount of time in order to get something, okay? But he wasn't a slave to Laban. Like, he was doing that because he wanted to, okay? And he entered that contract willingly. Now, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 43, I, I just want you to see this, um, that there is a difference between being... Uh, you know, a bond servant compared to being a hired servant, okay? Exodus 12, verse 43, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. Notice the difference, because he's saying the one's going to eat if you circumcise him, and it's saying this hired servant's not going to eat. Now, it's going to give a reason why he can't eat, it says in verse 47, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Notice, and when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, so that's the foreigner that can't eat, right? Notice it says, and will keep the Passover to the Lord. Let all his males be circumcised, then, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So why it's saying this in this manner is basically saying, if, if you have a bond servant, you can force them to get circumcised, pretty much is what it's saying here because you bought them with money, they're your servant, they have to do what you tell them to do, and so therefore they're going to keep the Passover, they're going to circumcise, but they have to be circumcised, you know, just because you're their, your bond servant or whatever doesn't mean that they'll, but he's saying for a foreigner and a hired person, you can't force them to do that, okay, you can't force them to get circumcised, but he's saying, but if they do get circumcised, they want to keep it, then they have to get circumcised in all the males in their house, does that make sense? But there is a difference between a bond servant and a hired servant. So when you look at, like, okay, I work my job, I'm not a bond servant to my boss, okay? Uh, most people that work jobs, you're not a bond servant. You're not under contract to say, hey, I have to work here or else kind of thing. Um, now, it's under contract in the fact that you do the work. That's a higher servant is you do the work, you get paid for the work that you do. There is a contract being made there, but it's not like you're bound to do it and, you know, you can't get out of it. You can't get out of the job. Now, there are certain contracts, though, when it comes to jobs, like where you can't, like, go into another job and, and, and do the same thing or work with the same clients and stuff like that. There's, weird, there's stuff like that in, in clauses when you work for a job, um, but that's a whole other story there. <laughs> so, but let's go back to Exodus chapter 21 and look at this passage here. Because at the very beginning of this passage, there's a limit being set to how long they have to serve. Notice that this isn't set forever. Okay, when we're dealing with this passage here. Now, with this case here, he's dealing with a Hebrew servant, meaning like a child of Israel or the children of Israel. So he's basically saying in your, in your country, those that are your countrymen, you're not to make them serve more than six years. So let's say you went into debt, you can't serve more than six years. That's what it's stating here, okay? Doesn't sound like slavery to me, okay? Yeah, it's basically you have a debt, and that's why you're doing this to begin with. But in Exodus 21, verse 1, it says, Now these things, now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh, 
Seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. Okay? Now, why it's saying for nothing is because imagine that, you know, they built up a debt and you agreed with them saying, how I'll work this off for you. It doesn't matter if after six years you didn't really work it all off. Does that make sense? Because it could be a really big debt or he did something really extreme to put you back a lot. It's basically saying, listen, they put in their six years, they're done. They're forget it's all gone. The debt's gone. Okay? And so that's what it's saying there. Notice in verse three. If he came in by himself, now this is where people get upset. Okay, I'm just gonna be honest with you. And this is where you just have to take the Bible for what it says. Okay? It says if he if he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. So he's basically saying what he brought in, he takes out with him. Does that make sense? So if you brought in wife, children, whatever, they go out with you. Notice in verse uh, 4, it says, If his master have given him a wife and shall have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. So this is where people get all hung up. Okay? And they're just like, man, that doesn't seem right. What you've got to understand with this is that imagine that you have children, you have a wife and children that you're, the person that, that's your employer, so to speak, gives you, and then he's taking care of them that whole time. Does that make sense? Like, if he's a bond servant to this person paying off a debt, he is not supporting those, the, his wife and children, right? So therefore, what I believe, why it's saying this, and if you want me to reason of why it's saying they don't go out with him, is because his... The master is the one that's been paying to feed them and, and brought them up. And so, they're, you know, he's the one taking care of them. And so he's paid for them, so to speak, for them to be there. Now, I believe that you could very well redeem them. And actually, what we're going to get into is that this case right here is what, what we'll see with the Bible. A lot of times when, when God says, if this happens, he's not saying that that should happen. He's just kind of giving you a case. If this is going on, here's how you deal with it. It's kind of like if you commit adultery, do this. It's like, does he want you to commit adultery then? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's very clear that, like, it's kind of like the, you know, he has that thing with um, the, the bitter water, right, that the woman's supposed to drink, the, 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 the jealousy thing, right, in numbers. Do you think God wanted, to, like, wants that to even be a thing? But he's kind of saying, if this happens, then do this. And it's not that he wanted it to happen to begin with. Because we're going to see later on that he, he actually commands that you do not make any of the children of Israel bond servants. Okay? So this chapter, when you're looking, you've got to read this in the fact that he's saying, if this happens, this is how you deal with it. And it's not even that God is wanting this to happen. Okay? Now, what you have to understand, though, is that this is a principle in the world that they were doing this type of thing. So it's almost like God's saying, hey, listen, this is going on. I mean, bond servants, uh, you know, servants is, is all around the world. And he's saying, in, in Israel, though, this is how you're going to deal with it. And it's not going to be a forever thing. It's not going to be something that you never get out of. Um, and so, but that's how I explain it a little bit as far as how I understand, I'm thinking through this. Like why, if he has a wife that's given to him, that's the key. It was given to him by his master. And back then, you got to understand that when they'd have a wife, they had to pay a dowry. That's why, late, that's why he worked for seven years for Rachel and Leah. Each one, he had to work seven years for them. And so if you're paying off your own debt, you can't really be paying for that dowry and be paying for this. So that's what it's getting into. Then it goes on and saying, hey, if you love your master and you love your wife and your children, you want to stay there, then just stay there. But I don't think that that means that he couldn't, like, redeem them either. And later on, we'll see that they have to be set free anyway after six years, okay? And then there's the year of Jubilee on top of that. So... I know I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm kind of just throwing all this at you at the beginning here. But there is a case where you're dealing with the heathen. So this is where people get mixed up too, is that it'll say later on, like the heathen, you know, they'll be your servants forever and all this. Stuff. There is a case where there's a certain group of people that basically were in servitude for something they did. And it kind of got passed down to them that they're under servitude to, these, to, to Israel. Go to Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9. But I want to mention this too. What happens here in Joshua, God didn't command it to happen. Okay, This is the case where the Gibeonites came and deceived Joshua and the elders. Remember, they came to him and they, they brought like moldy bread and, 
and tattered clothes pretty much and said, hey, we've come from very far away, <laughs> okay, and we want to make a league with you. And they're like, who are you? And they're like, oh, you know, we're from very far away. <laughs> and they deceived them, and they didn't seek counsel of the Lord. And they ended up making a league with them. They ended up being their neighbors, the people that they're supposed to be taking out. Okay, so this is obviously a special case where God is commanding them to, like, wipe these people out. But also, it never says that God says, tell them to do this. You know, this is how you deal with this situation. Uh, but in, in Joshua 9, verse 14, it says, And the men took of their victuals, and asked not counsel of the, at, at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them, and made a league with them, and let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. And it came to pass, at the end of three, three days, after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors, and they, that they dwelt among them. So, obviously they, they were deceived. They made this league with them, and basically that they wouldn't destroy them, all, the, all this thing. And obviously, everybody was angry at the elders. They're angry, like, what in the world? Why, did we, why can't we destroy them like everybody else that we're, we're taking out here? So this is how Joshua deals with it. Notice in verse 21, it says, And the princes said unto them, Let them live, but let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto all the congregation as the princes had promised them. And Joshua called for them, and he spake unto them, saying, Wherefore have ye beguiled us, saying, We are very far from you when ye dwell among us? Now, therefore, ye are cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and hewers of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. This is very different than going out there and stealing them and making them their, your servants, okay? They beguiled them. They, they forced them into a, a, an agreement under false pretenses. And, and again, even at that, this isn't God commanding them to do this, okay? This is just what the elders in Joshua decided to do, okay? Now, uh, like I said, this is something that goes on in the world, you know, where basically you have a, you have a debt and they would like even sell ch their children to the creditors for service, meaning like you're trying to pay off the debt and you're using your children to do that, right? And uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, go to 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, this is a story. Now, this isn't even a true story. This is a fabricated story, but it's a, obviously a believable story that happens because David you know, took it hook, line, and sinker. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, not, th this, is a, this is a true story. I'm thinking of another story with David um, where that woman feigned herself, um, you know, talking about her two sons that strove together and one killed another and they wanted to kill her only son. Anyway, this is dealing with Elisha and uh, the woman that he came to help. Now, verse 1 there in 2 Kings 4, it says, Now, there cried a, uh, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. So you see, why are they being bondmen? Because of the creditor, because of debt. Okay, so they have a debt, and they're basically saying, Hey, my sons are going to now be made bondmen. And this is the story, if you remember, this is the story where she had those vessels, find all these vessels, and they pour, poured oil. And in the, in the end, uh, once the last vessel was given there, the oil stopped, right? The oil stayed. And then she sold all the oil to pay off her debt, okay? So that's what we're dealing with here with this, this indentured servitude or this being a bondman or a bondmaid is you're paying off a debt, okay? So it's not like this is... Uh, they would get out of it eventually, right, if they paid off the debt. Now, go to Leviticus chapter 25. Now, Leviticus chapter 25 is all about the year of Jubilee. So what would happen is basically, let's say you went in, let's say you were a child of Israel, okay, you're, you're a, a citizen of Israel. You get into debt. There's no way out. You're just like, all right, I guess I got to pay this thing off. And whoever you're in debt to, the, ser the, the borrower is servant to the lender, right, Whoever you're in debt to, you work for them for six years, and on the seventh year, they have to let you free. Now, when they let you free, you don't really have anything, right? You're kind of, you're free, you paid off your debt, but you got nothing, right? In the year of Jubilee, which is every 50 years, they would have this release where they, you'd release all the, the bond servants, but you'd also give back the possessions that they lost. It was like a reset button. And this is where, you know, when you get into, uh, people are just like, oh, that doesn't, that, that doesn't seem fair. 
listen, that's the only way it's going to work. Because, you know, there's anarchists out there, and, these, and listen, I, I'm all for capitalism, but the, these true libertarian anarchists, listen, it won't work. So this idea of like, oh, a private property, you know, that's the, the key, is everybody's got private property. What if someone just bought up all the private property, and now it's a big monopoly by a private person, not the government, it's the same problem you have when the government tries to take control. But with the Bible, listen, the law of the Lord is perfect. If that happened, every 50 years, reset button, he, he's no longer over all that stuff. And so what would happen is, let's say, I was of, let's, say, well, let's say I was of Judah, right? And let's say I got into debt and I had to sell my possessions to someone in Reuben. Okay? Or even if it was in Judah, but I'm just using this as, a, as an example, right? And I had to sell it under Reuben. And let's say I was even in debt to where I had to serve, you know, bondage time, right? I have to work for six years and then I'm free. But I still don't have my land that I lost. Fifty years later, if I'm still alive, but if not, my, you know, my, my children would get that land back in 50 years. At the year of Jubilee, it would be a release and everything would be reset. And that's, you know, how, you know why they did that is because then... Judah might have just taken over everything, and it'd just be Judah. Judah owns everything, or Reuben, or whatever. You know, like it could have been like that. So that's how you preserve the the, the land of the tribes, because you know, if not, someone's taken over, or it's going to be so lopsided. And so uh, you say, well, you know, why is it like that? Listen, sometimes you don't understand, you don't really see it until you step back and think of like, hey, that could happen here. You have the the rich that just take over everything. What if someone was so rich they bought a whole state up? And then they could charge whatever they want. They could charge whatever taxes they want. And, you know, that's as much as uh, evil and, and, and uh, can be oppressive as a government. What's the difference? And so you've got to think about the, the, the aspects of private property. Listen, capitalism is the best way to go. A republic's the best way to go. But listen, everything has flaws when you have sinful people. And until we have a benevolent dictatorship where Jesus Christ is the king... And ruling and reigning with true righteousness, you're never going to have a perfect system. And so what the Old Testament was dealing with here is trying to deal with sinful people and dealing with how do you deal with debt? How do you deal with possessions? How do you deal with all this different stuff? And I believe this is a lot more humane to work off a debt than it is, first of all, to just say, okay, I'm, I'm not paying it and now I have bad credit, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Or... Uh, you know, think about that. Let's say someone owes me like $10,000 and they just declare bankruptcy. Now I'm out $10,000. I get nothing. Right? It's like a lot of times when people steal stuff from you, you, they never give it back to you. They end up having to pay like a lawyer and stuff like that. The lawyer gets the money, but you never see it. So what's, what makes more sense? They work it off and then now you're getting paid back at least something for what you lost and Normally, they may would go to prison for that, right? Let's say they, they embezzled money out of me and they went to prison. Well, now they're in a cage and now their wife's divorcing him, their kids disowned him. If they were a bond servant, hey, they're still out. They can still move around. They can still see their family. They bring their family in there with them, right? It's not saying separate your family. This actually is a lot more humane to deal with debt and deal with creditors than it is to throw someone in jail where they can't pay off anything. Not to mention, if you want to get into the prison industrial complex, when it comes to like how they can actually profit off prisoners and all this other stuff, and and so um, you know, yeah, the, the 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 not that this is real life, okay, but the Shawshank Redemption, you know, you kind of think of that type of stuff. Um, I've read stuff about that. Listen, I've never been to like inside a prison or anything like that to know what goes on, but there are corrupt prisons out there where where they do this type of shady stuff. And, um, and listen, it doesn't matter if that even wasn't going on. The fact of putting someone into prison is not in the Bible. Prison's not in the Bible. Uh, the police force isn't in the Bible. And listen, we got to deal with what we got, you know. Uh, we're living in the system that we have, so we got to deal with what we got. But what I'm saying with this is that, listen, people will balk at this, but then they're all for putting someone in prison for life. It's like, how about put them to death if they're worthy of death? And if they're not worthy of death, then give them their stripes and let them go. You know what I mean? And so the Bible is always true when it comes to stuff. And people say, well, you know, beating somebody, that's so inhumane. I'd rather be beat. 
than be put in prison for 15 years or whatever it is, right? I'll take the beating any day of the week. I think if you asked anybody in prison right now that has like 10 years or 15 years and you say, hey, I'll give you 40 stripes, save one, so every single person would be like, where's the post? I'm going to it, you know? I mean, because you think about it, I mean, that's, that's what the Bible teaches on a lot of these things. But in, in Leviticus chapter 25, what I want you to see here, remember we were talking about how like in Exodus 21 it says, if thou buy an Hebrew servant, okay? So it's notice it's, it's kind of giving it, it just doesn't say buy a Hebrew servant, <laughs> okay? That's the key that you need to understand with a lot of these things, it's saying if this happens, if this happens, this is how you deal with it. Um, but notice in Leviticus 25, it says this, And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant. But as an hired servant, and as a sojourner, and he shall be with thee, and shall serve thee unto the year of jubilee, then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. So notice that. Now this is a command. You know, this is dealing with the year of jubilee and saying, hey, do this. Okay, um, and so a lot of times in the Bible, like I said, you're dealing with things where it's not the best situation. It's kind of like if in in Exodus 21, and remember it's saying, you know, if you if you take a bond maid to a wife, and then you know you have another wife, you can't diminish your duties unto that wife. Okay, do you think God wants them to take another wife? No, He doesn't want you to have more than one wife. But he's basically saying, if this is the case, let's say you have two wives, you need to do the duty of a husband to a wife to both your wives, okay? It's not condoning polygamy, though, okay? And so, Pastor Huggins actually went through this uh, when we were in Exodus, and he did a fantastic job, in my opinion, when he was talking about this type of thing and just dealing with these different aspects and dealing with the fact of, are you dealing with a condition that God is commanding to do, or are you dealing with, hey, this is a certain situation, here's how you deal with it. Those are two different type of things. Um, now, I want to, as you go down in verse 44 there of Leviticus 25, I want to explain this too, because what this is basically saying is that if you have a child, if you're in Israel and you're a citizen of Israel, basically stating don't make any child of Israel a bond servant. Make them a hired servant, meaning that, hey, they're not, they're not bound, but they're hired, meaning that, hey, they can pay this off or they can pay their way along. And in context here, it's more so talking about someone that's poor. So they may not have accumulated debt yet. Okay, so it's more so like they're not getting into debt yet. You allow them to basically start working for you to where they don't get into debt. And so it's, 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 it's obviously better to be a hired servant than a bond servant. Okay, now in verse 44, notice what it says. And again, this is where people get caught up and get all huffy and puffy about what it says here. But... Uh, Le Leviticus 25, verse 44, it says, Both thy bondmen and, the, and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall you buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that's, that do sojourn among you, of them shall you buy and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession, they shall be your bondmen forever. But at, over your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule one over another with rigor. So this is where people will get kind of caught up on this, because now it's saying, you know, they're going to be forever. Now, there's, there's a couple ways to look at this. Obviously, you can kind of look at it with Joshua 9, where you're dealing with people that they're taking over, and they were supposed to be taking them out. They end up being thorns in their sides and all this other stuff. So you're dealing with a particular situation here where God is saying, destroy them all. But in this case, they would be your bondmen forever because they deceived you and beguiled you and you didn't end up taking them out like you should have. But you can't go back on your covenant. You know? So Joshua was stuck between a rock and a hard place because God commanded him to take him out, but he made a covenant to where he can't take him out. So he's kind of in a place where it's like Jephthah. There's no easy way out. There's no way to get out but sin. You know, you either kill your daughter in sin, or you break your covenant in sin. So you put, it, you put yourself in a place where you can't get out. But I more so look at this as far as just saying that, hey, forever you can do this with the heathen. 
It doesn't mean that they're, they can't get out of that bond service ever, okay? Because if you think about it, no one lives forever anyway, <laughs> okay? So uh, it would make more sense if you said until they die or something like that. But what I believe is he's saying is that, you know, as long as you're a nation, you know, basically forever, you can do this with the heathen, meaning you can buy bond servants. If they owe you a debt, you can put them in the bond service. But you're not supposed to do that with the children of Israel. But again, you're dealing with bond service. You're not dealing with slavery. Okay, you're dealing with someone paying off the debt. It's not saying you just go find heathen people or find the heathen people in the nation and just make them your servants. No, the reason is, is that they are indebted to you. And later on, it even talks about what if, you know, a child of Israel is indebted to a heathen person. See how it can always work both ways, too, because the, they can make themselves in debt to the heathen nation and then become a bond person to them. And it's saying, hey, you need to redeem them. And so it goes through this whole redeeming process of how you need to redeem your, your fellow brother from bond service. Okay? But it all goes into this fact of the fact that you're dealing with being an indentured servant, so you're paying off a debt. So it's something... See, slavery is something you don't deserve. Does that make sense? Like, slavery, the way we would look at it is like someone stole you, you know? You're just minding your own business. Someone stole you out of your country and then forced you into bondage. That's, that's something that is wrong, and the Bible says you should be put to debt. When we're dealing with indentured servitude, that's when you're going into a contract saying, I have a debt, I need to pay this off. Here's how it's going to happen. I have to serve so many years, and if you're a child of Israel, you can't go past six years. So you, pay your, you do your six years, you're out, you're done, you're free. Unless you get into another debt, and then you've got to pay that off, right? So, but here's the thing. Think about this. If this were in the place today, how many people do you think would be going into debt? How many people would be racking up a whole bunch of debt on their credit cards? Because nowadays, it's just like, well, I'll just declare bankruptcy. I won't have any credit, but I'll just declare bankruptcy, I'll be fine. And listen, if you declare bankruptcy, I'm not against you, Okay. But what I'm saying is that do you see the flaw in that system because who gets paid? Who, the, the people that you owed money get shafted. They don't get that money. They don't, they, they, you, you got services from somebody or you got something from somebody. And, and obviously, if let's say they took your house, they're getting, you know, they're getting like a collateral, right? So they're taking the house, so they get that. But let's say you just racked up a whole bunch of money on a credit card. Who's paying that? No one taxpayers probably, you know, and so that's where you get that, that shift of debt, okay, and listen, I was looking up the, the, the debt, the national debt rate, you want to get depressed, look at that, there's a debt calculator for the U.S. government, right, you know, for our, for our country, and it's just going up and up and up and up, it's just like, just flying forward, <laughs> right, and uh, here's the, the individual taxpayer debt, so who in here pays taxes? Most of the adults, right? <laughs> right? The children, not yet, right? You will know. You will learn, <laughs> right? No. Uh, so uh, each individual taxpayer has a debt of $179,000. That's what each taxpayer owes. Meaning that if we were to pay off the debt of America, which is like $21 trillion and rising, listen, when... Uh, before Obama got into office, it was eight, eight trillion. Eight trillion. It was 16 when he got done. And you will love Trump, right? It's 21. So, all that to say is that you want to talk to me about indentured servitude? We're in it. We're in it. Stop paying your taxes. See what happens. See what they take and whether you go to jail or not. And so, and I talked about this when we were talking about uh, Joseph. Remember, the, the Egyptians sold themselves to Joseph and Pharaoh. Do you remember how much they took from them? A fifth, which is 20%, which is more than what we get taken. Uh, we get taken more out of our paychecks. You're like, oh, you know, Social Security, that's not really a tax. Yeah, okay, then don't take it out of my paycheck. Good luck with that. FICA and all this other stuff. Anyway, so all that to say is that, you know, we're in debt. Go to Matthew chapter 17. We're, we're indentured servants to our government. Matthew 17, this is from your Savior dealing with whether you're free or not in your country. In Matthew 17 and verse 24, 
And listen, this is, we're not getting out of that. <laughs> you know, when do you think that someone's going to actually get an office to actually balance the budget and pay off this debt and stop spending all our money on stuff that it shouldn't be spent on? And then they take our ta they say no more income tax. Let me know when that happens, okay? I'm pretty sure Jesus is going to come before that ever happens, okay? Uh, the taxes, I don't see them ever going down. I just see them going up. But in Matthew 17, verse 24, it says, And when they, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? And he said, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto them, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. And then obviously he says, Not standing lest we offend them. You know, and he gets the, 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 the money out of the fish's mouth, right? Notice that, though, that if the children are paying tribute and custom, if, if they don't pay tribute and custom and the strangers are, they're free. So what does it mean if they are? It means they're not free. And even the, the children, uh, the, the, the Egyptians said, we're selling ourselves as bondmen to you. And he says, okay, give me, give me 20% of all your increase. And what is our government doing? And so you say, well, this is inhumane. Then our government better stop doing it. <laughs> okay. But here's the thing. This is actually for slavery because did I ask for this uh, $179,000, you know, taxpayer debt when I'm already paying taxes? Did I ask for that? Am I the one signing these bills saying that we need to send a whole bunch of billions of dollars over to all these other nations, to Israel, to, to Iran and, and Saudi Arabia and all these different places? Now, our government is selling us into slavery is what's going on. And so we're not even dealing with indentured servitude, okay? I didn't sign up for this, okay? I'm not the one that put us in debt, you know, personally. But our government's doing that. They're selling us into servitude to the rest of the world. Obviously, we know this is going to happen because of the end times. We see that happening with one world government, having one world currency, and, you know, basically... They're going to sell us into debt to where there's no other choice but to basically be under their rule, okay? Because the borrower is what? Servant to the lender. Who actually owns the countries in this world? It's the bankers, the Rothschilds, you know, the Jews, right? So listen to the proto. Get ready for the protocols that are coming out. But anyway, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, listen... All this comes down to this when, we, when we're dealing with servitude and all this. You, you say, man, that's depressing. <laughs> Listen, don't worry about that type of thing. Listen, we're, we, we're in this world, and we just got to deal with what we got. And we're just going to serve God. God's going to take care of us. And just as much as the children of Israel were in Egypt and under bondage, God can take care of you. God can bring you out of it. And God's going to protect his own. Listen, if there's a famine in this land and we're serving God, I believe God will feed us. And if there's catastrophes and there's all this other stuff going on and there's a shortage of men money and all this, God is going to take care of us. He's going to give us food and raiment, and don't worry about that. He, you know, as it says in Proverbs, you know, I've never seen the righteous beg for bread. And so uh, we need to not worry about it, and that's what I want you to see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 17. It says, But, God, but as God hath distributed to every man, and as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he, he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. So it's basically saying, hey, listen, if you're a bond servant, you're a servant, care not for it, you know, you're, you're the Lord's freeman. You're made free in Christ. But it's basically just serving wherever you're at. Wherever you got saved, just do what you got to do. And 
when, when we look at these passages, go to Ephesians chapter 6, and this is throughout, you know, the New Testament dealing with how servants should obey their masters. Listen, you've got to look at this as far as this, yes, this can be talking about a bond servant, but this is, could very well be talking about a hired servant. The only difference is that the hired servant can leave any time he wants, and he doesn't have to worry about it because he doesn't have anything hanging over his head, right? The bond servant has a bunch of debt hanging over his head, <laughs> okay? So he kind of has to stay there and do what he's got to do to pay off that debt. And these passages in Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3 and 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll see, is, is dealing with the fact of how we as servants. Now, this can apply as a job today. Listen, you know, we're, we're servants unto somebody. And even though, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm technically a principal at my company, I'm not really worried about losing my job or anything like that. I'm still a servant unto our clients because if, if we don't have any clients, then I don't get any money. <laughs> you know, I don't get paid unless we have work to do, okay? And therefore, I am a servant to somebody, and we all are. Anybody that has to make money, we're all a servant to somebody. There's always somebody that we're answering to at some capacity, okay? And so when you look at these passages, listen, this applies to us. Yes, it can apply to a bond servant too, but you got to look at this as far as, like, this is us right here. You know, we're, we're hired servants. Anybody that's working a job and trying to put food on the table has a master at some point. Be ye not many masters, knowing that you should receive the greater condemnation. Listen, you know, when it comes to work, I'm kind of mastering over certain people. They have to answer to me. But ultimately, I'm answering to the client. And so the buck always goes somewhere else when it comes to that, right? Um, and then ultimately, I'm answering to God, right? Ultimately, we all have that master who is God, but uh, even in this world, we all have people above us. So Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5, notice what it says. It says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of, uh, of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall, be, uh, shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Notice that, whether he be bond or free. So, either case here. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that, that your master also in heaven, neither, neither is, is there uh, respect of persons with him. So, obviously, you can look at this as a bond servant. You can look at it as a free servant, meaning that you're, you're a hired servant, Right? But in, in both cases, that's what you're dealing with. But are we dealing with slavery here? Because people will literally point to these passages and say, slavery in the Bible. Just because you say the word master, okay, that doesn't mean slavery. And even if it's a bond servant, that's not slavery. Now, you may in your Wikipedia page say that's slavery, and you may have like made some declaration somewhere in time past saying that bond service is slavery. That doesn't make it true. And that doesn't make it the same as what, you know, uh, what people did in the past and what they're still doing today, which is stealing people and make, enforcing them into servitude. That's not the same thing. And so if you get anything out of the sermon, there's a difference between an indentured servant or a bond servant than there is from a slave. And the Bible never says slave here. I showed you the only two places, so if you're trying to find another one, it's not there. There's only two places that slaves ever mentioned, and it has nothing to do and is not, never condoned. And, and it, it's, it's clearly not something that the Bible says we're a slave to Christ or we're a slave to this or that. Um, but go to 1 Peter chapter 2. In Colossians 3, it's the same thing. So it's, it's really uh, kind of the, the, the same thing we're dealing with here. But notice, I want you to see in 2 Peter, or 1, Peter 2, 1 Peter 2 and how it links this with how we, how we need to be like Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ came to what? minister not to be ministered unto. And what does minister mean? To be a servant. To serve. Right? And so if you're going to say this is slavery, then you're going to say that Jesus is a slave. Or that Jesus was a slave to the Father. You know, which isn't true by any stretch of the imagination. And he wasn't forced into that. He did this willingly. You know, not my own will, but thine be done. I mean, he, but he still had his own will to do it. He had to choose to do it. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, 
not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Notice this, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, now that was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, <clears throat> should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So now notice how it couples this with how we're supposed to be servants, and even if our, even if our masters were wrongfully entreating us, listen, we need to suffer through it, we just need to, to do what we need to do. And it's using Christ as an example how he suffered for us, and he went through all this, and he went to the cross. And he committed himself unto him that judges righteously, talking about the Father. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, it deals with that too, um, which I don't have it written down, but I'm just kind of thinking about it. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, dealing with us, and the end of the chapter there. It says, uh, verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And so, uh, you know that verse in 2 uh, Timothy where it says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's not talking about us sinning. It's talking about us committing ourselves unto the creator because we're enduring afflictions. We're, we're basically, I know he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him, what? Your soul. You've committed your soul. And we're talking physically here, right? Obviously, we're not talking about eternal salvation. We're talking about you're going through persecutions, trials, tribulations, and he's saying, I know whom I have believed. I know he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And so, unto him against that day is not that what you've committed against him. Okay? And so, when you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, and it's talking about, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls unto him as unto a faithful creator, you know, that's what you're dealing with, is, is the fact that, hey, he's able to keep you, even if you're suffering wrongfully. But we're all servants in this world. We're all servants, and whether you're bond, bond or free. But I beg to say that we're not free anyway. Okay, so when you're looking at this aspect here, are we really free? Are we really free and not bound in this country? Because even if you were to say, well, I don't answer to anybody, you know, I just make money. It just, I make it rain at my job, and it doesn't matter who's over me, <laughs> okay? Even if you were to say that, stop paying taxes and let me know how that goes. And stop paying your Social Security, stop paying this and that, because we're servants, honestly, to the government. And it should be the other way around. It was never intended to be that way. But that's what we, we sold ourselves into bondage because we wanted security instead of liberty. And uh, that's what we're dealing with. The, the book of Philemon hits on this. I'm not going to read it for sake of time. But Onesimus, um, you know, is, is the person that Paul won to the Lord when he was in his bonds. He was, he was in prison, okay? He wasn't a bond servant, but he was in prison. And he sends him back to Philemon because he was Philemon's servant, Okay? And he basically says to him that, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, now, or not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So now he's a servant in the Lord to him and in the flesh. And, you know, obviously there's that, that bond servitude, or that indentured servitude. But again, it's based off a contract that you're making, you know. And even according to Wikipedia, it's stating that, hey, this was something that's being contracted between these two people. It's like an employee-employer uh, relationship, only it's a little more intense because you're dealing with uh, a debt, okay? And so, uh, but again, when you're looking at these passages, you know, you got to understand that the Bible's right and the world's wrong. So even if you're like, hey, I don't really have a good answer for that, it doesn't matter. The Bible's right, the world's wrong. I don't really care what they think or wh whether they think that's not right. It's, it's right. It's the Bible. But I do think that a lot of times they're ripping this out of context and they're making it say things it's not saying. 
It never says in here to steal people and make them your servants and make them your servants forever. It's saying that if they're in debt, you know, then that's a viable option for them to pay off the debt. Uh, but then you see kind of God's heart in that saying, hey, listen, don't make them do this forever. You know, you know after six years, they're done. They're out. So you can, see, you can see God's heart in that as well. Basically, like, understand kind of the mercy in that. Because technically, let's say you had a really big debt that you can never pay off. Right? Let's say it's just like some debt that there's no way you'd ever make enough money. You'd never be able to work for someone long enough. Technically, you should have to pay for that the rest of your life. That would be the just thing to do. But you can see the mercy that God has where he's saying, listen, you know, after six years... You need to let them free for nothing. You know, basically let them go. They worked off what they could do, but don't make them a bond servant for the rest of their life. And then they'd have the year of jubilee, and they'd have this reset button and all this stuff. God's word is perfect. His, his way is always perfect. And I believe in a thousand year reign, this is what we're going to be dealing with. Listen, there's going to be people living and dying. They're not all going to be in a resurrected state like we are. Obviously, everybody here that's saved, we're going to be in our resurrected state and we're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. But there's going to be people living and dying for a thousand years, and I believe all this will be applying. That's just what I believe on. I don't believe there's going to be customary, like, dietary laws necessarily. You know, there's not going to be sacrifices being made. But these are moral laws, right? When you're dealing with putting someone to death, uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, all this stuff. And and it, I think it is very interesting that... The one chapter that they're always trying to say endorses slavery says that someone should be put to death for slavery, right? It's like, isn't that, isn't that ironic that it's in the exact chapter? It's not even that I had to go through the next chapter and be like, hey, you should have read the next chapter. No, you should have read the chapter you're actually accusing God of slavery for. And so hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, but I hope that answers your question because there will be people that will say, hey, the Bible teaches about slavery. And you can say, no, it doesn't. <laughs> It doesn't condone slavery. And, you know, anytime anybody said that to me, you know, I'm always just like, I learned this in middle school, that there's a difference between indentured servitude and slavery. And so as soon as I, when I read this, I never had a problem with it. Does that make sense? I, when I read it, I'm not like, man, why is the Bible teaching about slavery? I understood the difference between that. And the world doesn't see that, though. You know, they, they, they just jump at the chance to say there's something wrong with the Bible. But if someone asks you about that and just say, listen, it's indentured servitude. And it's right because God condones it. God would not condone sin. Okay. And so, um, but that's the way you should always look at the Bible when it comes to troubling passages. It's just like, this is what it says. I believe it automatically. Now let's see how it fits with the rest of the Bible. And so let's end with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what we thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word, and Lord, just how perfect it is. And Lord, just uh, thank you for this church, and I pray that you'd be with us, and I pray that you'd be with those that aren't feeling well, and pray for your healing hand to be upon them. I pray that you'd be with us throughout the rest of this week, and especially as we bring in this new year, I pray that, uh, that we do great works for you, and that your name would be glorified. And Lord, we love you, and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's do one more song before we get going here. Any requests? No one jump up at once. What is it? 325. 325. 325 in your hymnals. And once you find your places, if you'll stand. <clears throat> I don't know if I, I have led this right.